I want to, and, and, and this is not a political message by no means, but I think that sometimes that the title of my message will appear to be political, even though it is not. But I want to preach on the message, build that wall. Build that wall. And I hope and pray that you will see what I'm talking about uh, when this is, I know the, the one song that Christy sang this morning said, tear down that wall. I said, wait a minute, she got the wrong song. We got to build up that wall. So, but there are walls that have to be tore down, but there are also walls that have to be built. So 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13, and then I'm going to move over to Psalm 139 for a verse, but it says this, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. And then Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24 a bold, bold declaration from David. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious, anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Now, I, can, I think a lot of Christians know that scripture. But that ain't one of the most quoted scriptures that people go around quoting all the time. They may do Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, he making me lie down in green pastures. But when we come to this verse that says, test me, search me, point out, test me to see if it is the way it is. On Tuesday and Wednesday night, I woke up each night around 3.30 or 4 a.m. in the morning, and I could not go back to sleep. My mind became consumed, unfortunately, with the thoughts of where my water pipes might be vulnerable to the extreme cold at my house, at, here at the church, and a couple of other properties that I have to look after. And I know there's some people in here in this building that I wouldn't want to have to wake up with your worries and what you got to think about for busted pipes. But I, I got that on my mind. And it dawned on me Tuesday night after I had awakened that I had forgotten to set the temperature at the proper level in one of the houses that I was looking after. I also remembered that there were two outdoor faucets at that same dwelling that I was not sure how they were protected from the cold. I also thought about a water cutoff box that I had that wasn't as deep in the ground as I would like for it to have been, and I hadn't done anything to reinforce its ability to resist the extreme cold. So now at 3.30 and 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm having visions in the middle of the night of unwanted ice sculptures forming outside of my house. You know, I just can't wait to see the artwork the next morning. Because I hadn't thought through my situations as good as I should have, and my, my lack of preparations were allowing my mind to race about wildly as I envisioned what the morning light might bring. Therefore, I did not have peace those two nights that I needed to finish out a good night's rest. Why? Because in some ways, and thank God nothing happened, my property was vulnerable to the extreme cold. And my lack of preparations had robbed me of my peace and my rest. And that's the thought that I want to send to us here today is about our vulnerabilities, the places to where we may be open and exposed in our lives that is going to be critical in our spiritual journey with the Lord. The, you, there's a, 
I guess there's a positive vulnerability and there's a negative vulnerability. People talk about relationships, about being vulnerable, about being open to one another, about putting yourself out there, your emotions and stuff, and risking that people won't trample them when you become vulnerable. But I'm talking about a, the other vulnerability, to when you are open. In fact, the definition for that vulnerable means to be at risk, to be unprotected, exposed, or assailable. Being open to attack or damage. Able to be easily hurt, influenced, or attacked. Now this is what can happen to us from a spiritual perspective if we are not closing some of the doors that God wants us to shut down. If we're not reinforcing and protecting some areas of our spiritual life. We are going to be open to be assailed, attacked, damaged, easily to be hurt or influenced or attacked in our life. You see, vulnerabilities are a part of being a human being. However, some, some vulnerabilities can be tolerated or lived with because the fallout in our lives are not that consequential. For instance, if I forget to set my alarm clock before I go to sleep, I'm making myself vulnerable to not being somewhere on time. But that's usually not that big a deal as long as it doesn't become a habit and I'm not missing something that is very super important. So that's kind of inconsequential in a way. But if, a, if you forgot and left the number of the woman that a person was having an affair with in your pants pocket and today is your wife's wash day, that is going to be consequential like you've never seen in your life. The vulnerability of these situations is that we are open in a lot of areas of our life from those slight ones to something by sin, as I've made note of, that could be very large. But there are three types of vulnerabilities that all of us can have an experience from time to time. Number one, there are vulnerabilities that you are aware of right now as you sit here in this church. You there are vulnerabilities that you're aware of, yet you lack the motivation to fix them because they bring fleshly pleasure to you in your life. So these are those that you know, but you won't fix. Number two, there are vulnerabilities that you are not aware of as you sit here until a perfect storm exposes those vulnerabilities and brings it to the light. Those sometimes are the most hardest to deal with. Sometimes those are the ones that can create the most damage in our life because they seem to take us by surprise. And the third type of vulnerability are the vulnerabilities that masquerade themselves as a strength or a good quality in our life to be admired while they are working on your downfall and your defeat. For example, Peter was a very self-confident individual. He, everywhere he goes, I'm sure on that day people looked at him and admired him for his confidence, admired him for, for all the boldness that he had. But that self-confidence that he had became a vulnerability in his life. Later on, when he wound up denying Jesus that he even knew who he was. So don't allow something that appears to masquerade as a strength to wind up being your undoing. We must always walk in humility before the Lord. One American pastor put it this way. He said, there are two times in your life when you are especially vulnerable, when you have nothing and when you have everything. I want to say that again. When you have nothing and when you have everything, that is when you are exposed to vulnerability more than any time in your life. So it pays to stay close to God. In every one of these situations, whether you're, Paul says, I've learned how to be content 
in the very situation that I'm in. He says, whether I have nothing or whether I have all things, I've learned to be content. In other words, he didn't put himself out there to be vulnerable to Satan's attack, to offer him things that he did not need, and therefore Satan could not take things away from him that he had because Jesus was his everything. Amen? And that's the way we have to see that today. But be careful about those vulnerabilities. Many Americans today are losing sleep and peace of mind today because of the open border policy of our current administration. No doubt in my mind that many terrorists have already slipped across our borders, have gotten by our much overworked border patrol. And as a result, when it comes to our national security and even our personal security, we are more vulnerable today than we have ever been in our country today. A wall was started in 2016 that if completed, it probably would have eliminated over 95% of all types of illegal entry into our country. As politics always goes, the wall was stopped and the barrier was ceased that would shut down this vulnerability in our country. Let's bring this thought home from a spiritual standpoint. What has happened to the spiritual walls that you were building in 2023 to prevent the enemy from establishing his thoughts and his ways in your life? You begin to build walls, you begin to erect them, you begin to say, I'm not going to allow that stuff in my home. I'm not going to allow that stuff in my mind. I'm not going to allow that to encroach upon my peace. But somewhere, just like our country did in these past four years, some Christians have stopped building the walls that would keep the enemy out of our lives. And you know and I know as I lay awake the other night and it unnerved me because from a physical standpoint, I was vulnerable. But this same experience that I had laying there those two nights awake each night caused me to examine my spiritual life. It caused me to examine myself from the perspective of where am I Vulnerable. Have I allowed the devil to get a foothold in my thinking and my thoughts and my life in any way, shape, form, or fashion? Folks, you say, Pastor, why are you preaching like this? Because I'm preaching like this because you do not be, need to be in a place of spiritual vulnerability. You need to be in a place of power so that you know who you're grounded in, who your Savior is, who is going to sustain you in life, and you never look back, but you look forward and you keep going at a pace that we can see the glory of God begin to come into our churches once again. Amen? Amen. We need and must have this in our lives. But we quit building. For some reason, we have stopped what was being constructed to keep the world out of our life. You see, if you don't keep those walls up to keep the world out, it's going to stunt the spiritual growth and what God wants to happen on the inside of you. It cannot both happen simultaneously. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God and expect that you're going to grow exponentially in God. It can't happen because he must be first in our life and we must ask him, where am I vulnerable? What is it that you are leaving an ear open to? What is it that your eye is on that shouldn't be? I'm telling you, it is important. You see, as I said in our text scripture again, many people won't do what David did. We won't come back in Psalm 139 and say, Lord, I want you this week to put me through a test. I want you to put me through something that will expose where I have sin in my heart. I want you to put me through a trial that will show where I have left spiritual doors cracked and open and where the devil could raid me from a spiritual perspective if he wanted to. 
David knew because he may have not knew that it was in him, but he knew how easy it was for him to fall as he got into the adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. He repented, and after this, we hear this cry from him saying, Lord, test me. Search me. See if there is any wicked way in me. You know what the problem is? Most of us, all of us, more than likely have some type of wicked ways within us. Amen? Oh, we don't want to admit that because we're in church. But that's where we need to admit it and we need to say it. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means there's times that we open a door here and we open a door there. That's why in the first scripture in Corinthians, he talks about the temptations. He knows temptation is going to come against you. But if you'll stay hid and sheltered in him, he will cause the temptation not to be stronger than what you can bear. But if you don't shore up your vulnerabilities and allow the devil to come in at full speed the way he wants to, you are going to diminish the effect of what God could do in your life when this comes along. Are y'all following what I'm having to say to you today? Listen, our text today prods us to examine our spiritual vulnerabilities. And then the second thing it does is it prods you to identify them. It doesn't do you any good if you examine them, but then you take a look at it and you say, hmm, let's put a name to that because this is what it is. But that's where a lot of people stop. You're not just to examine for spiritual vulnerabilities and identify them, but you're supposed to do something about them. Do Somebody say do. Do is an action word. It means you are to put into motion something that will rectify that situation. Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds, on, builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise... And the winds beat against that house. It won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish like a person who builds a house on sand. For when the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. The difference between those Two there is that some recognize it, they identified it, but they did something about it. They built on a foundation that would not shift or crack or crumble under them. And many people have not done that today. You see, when it comes to Christians having vulnerabilities that they are aware of, and I want you to hear this good because the Holy Spirit really dropped and sunk this into my spirit. When it comes to Christians having vulnerabilities that they are aware of, I am concerned that many in the church today have elected to remain in repentance mode, remorse and regret, because they don't want to put forth the effort to modify and change their behavior. All we want to do is repent. We just want to say, I'm sorry, Lord. Please forgive me of this sin. And we keep going on with these same vulnerabilities that are able to sap our strength, that are able to keep us from doing the will of God and the Word. And it comes up again, and we say, forgive me. We stay in repentance, in remote, in remorse mode. But we don't go to the next step to change our behavior. And if you want to walk in that cycle, if you want to walk down that road, it's going to be a life of torment. It's going to be a life that's going to be a struggle like you've never seen. Because you're dragging weights, you're pulling things that you don't have to pull because you're not rolling them over on the Lord. Because you, all you want to do is say, I'm sorry. And God hears that. Believe you me. God hears that, and I believe that when it's done with a sincere heart, I believe that God receives that and gives us repentance. 
But somewhere along the, mo the way, we have to make a decision whether you're going to build on the rock or you're going to build on the sand, whether you're going to build upon the promises of God or whether you're going to build upon the expectations of men. Somewhere in our life. In our text in 1 Corinthians, it says, the scripture starts out, it says, if you think you are standing strong, if you think is an interesting thought because that little phrase right there signifies that or it implies that there may be hidden influences in your and my life that is shielding us from seeing and knowing something about our lives as clearly as we should. In other words, if you think you are standing strong, if you think, so, so here he's saying, okay, how are you thinking? Is there hidden influences in your life that are causing you to have vulnerabilities that we know that, that, or that you're not aware of? I mean, we know this to be true because of the parable that Jesus spoke about the sanctimonious people trying to remove a splinter from a person's eye while they had a log in their own. That's not an easy job. I don't want you working on me if you've got a log in your mind and you're trying to remove a splinter out of mine. In other words, the person with the log in their eye has hidden influences that are directing them ways that are not God's ways. And we need to understand that in our lives. For example, Saul in the book of Acts, though he thought he was doing God a favor by murdering and eliminating Christians. But it was his Pharisaic zeal for the law and the traditions of man that was blinding him to the grace of God. And he actually thought he was doing God's service by killing them. And yet it was a vulnerability that was making him open and we see that God took him down on the road to Damascus and had to show him where he had left the door open and that was not God. It was a hidden influence in his life that was going against the grace of God. For example, Ananias and Sapphira could not fully discern their wickedness in the offering they were about to give because they were being satanically seduced and blinded by their need of admiration and approval of man. You see, they, Barnabas, you, you read the prescription on that, and you see he had sold much of he had. He took the money, he went, and he laid at the apostles' feet, and he gave it to the church. Well, Ananias and Sapphira in some way are trying to mimic this. And they're trying to justify through a hidden influence that they have in their life that has left them open to destruction in their life. And somewhere down the road, they, they probably rationalized that even though they knew what they were doing was dishonest, in the end, it was going to be a win-win for everybody. The church wins because they get an offering, and we win because we've sold a piece of property. Let me tell you something. Your rationalization only leaves you open to the devil. We must close down those doors and say integrity, honesty, and purity must be demonstrated in our lives every day that we live, or else we're going to wake up in the middle of the night with sweat breaking out on us, and we're going to be be fearful because we've left ourselves open to be publicly and to be spiritually humiliated. Hear me. Hear me, hear me, hear me. For example, in Galatians chapter 2, Peter could not see the damage his hypocrisy was causing because he also was being influenced, hiddenly influenced by a spirit of wanting to be liked and pleasing to everyone. The scripture says in Galatians 2 that Paul was so moved in, the, in a negative way because of his hypocrisy that he called him out in front of everybody. What was he doing? When the Gentiles would come to where Peter was, Peter was acting like a Gentile. He was eating their food, fellowshipping with their people, but then all of a sudden Paul saw a group of Jews come and Peter slyly backed out of that crowd and got over here and acted like he didn't know who they were. 
He was becoming, he was, he, what was he doing? He was fixing to open the door to bring public humiliation to the body of Christ where Jews and Gentiles were concerned because of his hypocrisy. And Paul had to call him out on it. And let me tell you something. We are going to have to have spiritual leaders that are going to call out these things, not judgmentally, but to call out these places of vulnerability so that we will know how to shore them up in life. Look, I believe, for many reasons, but I believe that 2024 is going to be one of the, the biggest years for spiritual refinement in the church like we have never seen. I went in, you know, sometimes I get these crazy things going, and I went in and I run a reference on every scripture in the Bible that had 2024 in it. If a book had 20 chapters and that 20th chapter had 24 verses in it, I ran them down. And 90% of those verses, and they were 14 of them that I ran down, all had to do with judgment on integrity or judgment with sin, judgment with something. If you read one verse up or down, you'll get the full story. But 24 generally did it. I believe we're going to see a purification happen in the church's realm because we've got to shut down the doors of vulnerability into our families, into our schools, into our lives, into our church. Wherever we go, we're going to have to walk with the confidence that comes from God because His grace that comes to us and his power that fills our life that we walk not in self-confidence but we walk in the confidence that the Holy Ghost has brought to us in our lives oh hallelujah my God folks shut those doors down build that wall build it until it goes up to the place that the devil cannot penetrate that wall and you keep him out and you keep him at bay and you keep him in the place that he needs to be to where you can flourish as a child of God. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Look, and, and, and let, me just, let, let me just say this it, because this needs to be said to those who are listening especially by, on our social media. The greatest place of vulnerability that a person can be in is not to know that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. That is the ultimate place of vulnerability. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction forever, separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. It cannot be any clearer than that today if we are not saved we are vulnerable every day that we live to hell's flames and go into a place that Jesus came to save you from and there are many out there that are walking in that place of vulnerability every day of their life listen to me if you you, you are so vulnerable in life if you think you're saved, but you're not. You know, I, you say, well, that's the same thing. No, it's not. There's, there's a little bit of difference between a person who's never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, maybe, or, or don't go to church, it has nothing to do with it, but you have a person sitting in church who thinks they're saved, but they're not. How horrible. How horrible. Matthew 7, 22. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. You see, here's what the church does. The church tries to find out ways to soften that scripture. But when you read the context, he's not speaking to heathens. He's speaking to Christians. He's speaking to people who are supposed to know him. And he's saying these are people 
for whatever reason, were so vulnerable that they were claiming they were saved. But when it came to judgment day, when it came for the day that God examined and set apart the sheep from the goats, he said to them, I never knew you. I don't care what you have to say. I don't care what miracles you try to profess or to proclaim that you have. I don't know who you are. I don't know you. Now, don't let the devil throw condemnation on you when you hear Scripture and preaching like that if you're God's child. There's none of us perfect. There's none of us running so straight of a race that any of us don't need forgiveness in our life. I'm not talking about that. You know how the devil comes and plays with your mind, tries to tell you you're not saved, tries to tell you all this mumbo-jumbo that he does. But the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but the Spirit. But listen, it's time that we recognize that people will think they're saved. They've been told. They've come to the front of a church and simply been told you're saved. Just repeat this prayer and you're saved. Listen to me. It's more than that. To shut down the vulnerability, you've got to know who's in your heart. You've got to know who's in you. And you can. That's the thing. You don't have to be vulnerable from that standpoint in life. Amen? You see, in Galatians 5 and 24 through 25 he says those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there now look if you're looking for something to get you away from that vulnerability mode listen to what it says again those who belong to Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since they are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our life. Amen? Listen. An unguarded, undisciplined, breakneck lifestyle is dangerous. Even in our own society, we have a sign that says don't do this or a sign that says don't do that or a sign that says beware. Why? Because they're trying to tell you that you have to learn to slow up and slow down or don't do this or don't do that. But you see, disregarding certain laws imperils our welfare. And the difference between following God's commands and not following them is the difference between running on cement and running on ice. You're going to fall if you run on ice long enough. Amen? Hey, no way. You're going to fall. You're you're going to go out from under you. But if you're on the solid foundation of God and you're, you're walking by His rules or his law or his grace or his mercy listen to what C.H. Spurgeon and and Brad and Christy if y'all will come listen to what C.H. Spurgeon said about a complacent Christian he said I cannot emphasize enough the impending danger for those that neglect spiritual vigilance for those that live like God is not taking account of their words and actions Remember what Galatians 6 and 7 says. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows, and the one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. And the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will receive eternal life. It's just that simple in our lives, our actions. If we sow to the flesh, you're going to reap vulnerability. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap a life that's going to shame you, that's going to humiliate you, whether now or on the other side of eternity. God does not want a single person in here to be vulnerable in any place they don't have to be. 
If you've opened the doors, if you've tore down the wall, if you've ceased building that wall, the Bible says that God was seeking for a person who would stand in the gap and make up the hedge. What is the hedge? It's a wall. Make it up. And in the meantime, he needed people to stand in the gaps to where the enemy couldn't get through. And I'm going to tell you that whatever it is, if you even dare to have the boldness to pray Psalm 139 that David did, to say, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Test me and know if there is anything there that should not be. Look. The last comment on this is that if you go and read Ephesians chapter 6, you find in Ephesians 6 the armor of God. If you put on that armor and keep it on, it will make you less vulnerable wherever you go in life. But if you don't put it on, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the sword of the Spirit, and the shield of faith. You see, sometimes, you know, all you got, y- y'all know how it is when you're running down the road and all of a sudden the police officer pulls up beside you and you just become an instant model citizen. All of a sudden how you're just driving so nervously perfect and so on. It's because you're fully aware at that point that you've got to really make sure you're crossing every T and dotting every I. But you know something? There's something in spiritual warfare that when a soldier is decked out in his armor, sometimes he don't even have to fight some battles because the devil looks at him and says, whoa, whoa, whoa. He's got that sword going. He's got that shield of moving up and down. And maybe sometimes in life it'll keep you from some battles. But I'm going to tell you that if you keep that armor on, it'll keep you from being vulnerable to where the world's people are vulnerable today. And God wants you to be strong in the Lord. At the beginning of 2024, as we go through the fires, as we go through the persecutions, as we go through the refinements, as we go through the judgments that will come upon this nation for the immorality that it is sunk to, we all are here and a part of it. But God help us not to be vulnerable to the devil, to the flesh, to those type of satanically induced, influenced in our life. Be willing to build that wall and separate yourself from them. While your heads is bowed across this building, I know that I have fought and wrestled with this message all week. I don't usually fight and wrestle with a message like that, but I have to fight with my own vulnerabilities. I have to fight with my, bro- my vulnerabilities in my prayer life. I'm praying like I ought to pray. And just really, I pray a lot. But sometimes I don't steal away like I should to that private place. I don't go into that closet. I don't stay there to where God can really speak in a powerful way. And I deal with those vulnerabilities and say, Lord, help me in 2024 not just to pray and not to offer prayers and not to just seek your face in that vein, but truly to get to a place to where I say, oh God, saturate my soul with your Holy Spirit. Pour in me, O oh God, that wherever I go and whatever I do, I remember Jesus in all that I do. I don't know what you today, I believe the Holy Spirit has already spoken to every person in this house. I believe he's already spoken to you personally and me. He's been speaking to all week and even now. To say, Pastor Jeff, I am going in my own spirit to put a name on my vulnerability here this morning. And with that, I am going to seek God to help me to shore up any weakness that I have in my life. Not that I may become strong for others to look at and go, wow, what a Christian that is. Even though our life is to be a light set on a hill that people can see our fathers, see the works that we're doing for the Father and give glory and honor to Him. But the whole chief thing is to bring honor to God as a son and a daughter and a child of God. 
And if you're in this building, my heads are bowed, and you would say, Pastor Jeff, there is a vulnerability that I've quit building against. I've quit defending against. I just kind of wink in my spirit. I just kind of take it lightly. But the Holy Spirit has come to let me know that he wants me to get serious about not allowing the devil to have a foothold in my life. And if that's you here this morning, you would just say, pray over me, Pastor. Would you just slip up your hand and say, that's me? I'm going to put a name on it. Just slip up your hand if you're going to put a name. Amen. 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 Come on. Amen. Amen. I see that. Anyone else? Amen. Thank you. I see that hand. Anyone else? Anyone else? I see that hand. Thank you. This is important, folks, for us to do. It's, I can't tell you how important this is. You can't live with fakeness and shallowness. You've got to go to the core. Because remember, Galatians, if you sow to your flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to your spirit, you shall of the spirit reap life. Anyone else? My head's just bowed. Would you slip up your hands like Pastor Jeff? Yes, thank you. I appreciate that. Anyone else? Anyone else? Hallelujah. His grace and his mercy covers it. His love. And you, and, and you know how you do that? How you guard against vulnerability? You study your word of God. You do things like praying regularly. You live humbly before God and not arrogantly. You repent of any sin that comes your way and make the necessary changes that you need to make. And then you get actively involved in the ministry and the work of Jesus Christ on this earth. And remember always to keep Jesus at the centerpiece of everything you do. And if you do that, those vulnerabilities will begin to slip away. You'll always have them to some degree, but not to the point where they're glaring you in the face and mocking you. Hallelujah. I want to pray over you right now. I, I, I want you just to keep your heads bowed if you would. Father... There's something dynamic and powerful happening in this building this morning because of your word. Not because of me, I'm nothing. I recognize in John 15 that he's the vine and I'm a branch. And without him, I can do absolutely nothing. That's what the scripture says. But I know who can. And Jesus, I call you. The Holy Spirit of God to come upon every hand that was raised up and to help them and to strengthen them to be an overcomer to build those walls of defenses against the enemy and everything that he would try to flood in their life. The Bible says that he will raise up a standard when the enemy tries to come in like a flood and bowl you over. That standard is the righteousness and the strength and the power of the Holy Ghost. And Father, today, we're simply asking what we should always do. Forgive me, O oh God, because I've known in my spirit that I need to keep building that wall against that through the Holy Spirit so that I can remain humble and not arrogant about what God does in my life. Lord, I want to be an overcomer. I want to sow to my spirit and not to my flesh. I want to walk pleasing to you. And I know no denomination, no church, no pastor can, can be that thing for me like that. Only Jesus, through the power of his Holy Spirit, can give us that kind of strength that we need to overcome. And so, Lord, come. Come. Heal. Forgive. Cleanse. Sanctify. By the power of the Holy Spirit over every hand that went up in this building today. And I pray throughout this week that the voices of vulnerability will be silenced. That the voices of vulnerability will begin to die out. Their voices of condemnation, 
the voices of stirring up fear and anxiety in my life. I kill it in the name of Jesus. I push a tondri bakasaya. Lindo roko shala bahaso mandri bikishe. Ori bikishan robo hora mandri bikishe la mahonda. Baro kari amashiki liondri bisholobo ora manda. Ela mandori bikishende ilaha koloshende rebehiso masendri bishataya. For I say unto you this day that I am with you, saith the Lord. Take my yoke upon you in this hour. And I, the Lord God, will bear those burdens. Cast them upon me. I am waiting for you to put the fullness of your confidence upon my word and upon my son, Jesus Christ, and live through the power of the Holy Spirit. For I say unto you, I will transform your life. I will transform your family. I will transform your church. I will transform your community and your nation. But I need people who are bold, who will not be walking looking behind their backs expecting this to unfold and that to unravel for I am the Lord God and I am your strength and I will take you to that place that I said I would I will bring you through to the complete promises of what I have proclaimed in your spirit dig them up saith the Lord and expect me to move for I will show you great and wonderful things in this hour saith the Lord God. Glora bakara mashino hila mahasaya. Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost. Woo, hallelujah. Come on, just let him in. Let him in. Let him in. Let him in. Talk to him. Begin to just let him change and heal and flood your soul with the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse and make whole and make well. Hallelujah. Let him transform you sitting right there where you're at right now because we get clear and open and honest before God. And we, we stop the, the cloudy stuff, the murky stuff. Hallelujah. And we say, God, like David, I want to come clean. I want my rivers to be flushed out so that what's flowing in them is clear, good, perfect, and desirable, not only with God, but for others who would see my life. Oh, we love you, God. Oh, ina ma 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 ma. She da ba 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 kasi. Ina no 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 mo she kala ba haya. Ori be kishindi ilo mohota. Oh, our good God, our great God, our masterful Lord. Hallelujah! You triumph. You triumph in our lives through your Word, through righteousness and holiness and peace and joy. Temperance, goodness, meekness, kindness. Oh God, that we would display the fruit of the Spirit. That we would shun and run away from every demonstration of the Spirit of the flesh. Hatred, malice, anger, division, immorality of every kind. Oh God, come, come into my soul. Hallelujah.